Good morning. Good morning. When we meet someone for the first time uh, in the church, usually I still remember, there are lots of questions we can ask, but there are two main questions we usually uh, ask. Number one is, what is your name? What is your name? You want to know who that person is. And the second or third question will be, uh, what do you do for a living? What is your job? And some people will proudly tell people about their job. Others will, be, will think that maybe my job is not that excellent. Yeah. But that tells us something about what we always want to know, who we are and what we do. Work is a very significant part of our lives. It is it's almost inseparable part of our lives. We work. Some people, we work all their lives until they die. Other people want to retire as early as possible. Uh, and our understanding about work is influenced by our culture, the place where we live, our educations, and so forth. I still remember a conversation I had with a friend of mine a long time ago. He's a Dutch. He came to Jakarta and uh, he uh, went to a Tukang Bechak as a three wheeler bus uh, biker. It was around 11 in the morning, and that guy is not working anymore. He was talking with his friends and having coffee uh, while there were still lots of clients. They said, Why don't you uh, continue to take clients? And that man told him that. I have worked from the morning. I have had enough already for myself today. I've had enough today. I don't have to work again. Uh, I, will, I will enjoy my life for the rest of the day and go home. That was a shocking thing for him because he always uh, thinks that we, con- we work and we need to continue to work whether we have enough or not, whether you have earned a lot or not. You work until you die. And I could see him uh, keep working until until the end. Uh, This is maybe two extremes, but probably this is speaking about views of some of us, probably. We just need to work to earn enough so we can retire. Others will think, I just need to continue to work. I hate rest. Uh, I I want to uh, continue to accumulate more, probably. Probably it's never enough for me. What does the Bible say about work? We are in the uh, series of God's uh, original uh, design of this world, okay? And uh, if you have been fishing us for the last couple of Sundays, uh, two Sundays ago, we heard about God's original designs for a natural world. Last week on Mankind... We are created in His image and likeness, male and female, something that is very challenging for us uh, uh, today. And today, uh, I'm uh, going to talk about work from Genesis chapter 1, 28, 31, and chapter 2, verse 8 to uh, 17. Next week, we'll be talking about family and then uh, redemption. Uh, let me read from Genesis, uh, and we learn as we go. God, God blessed them, men and uh, women, uh, and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I will I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. That will be yours for food. So you can see from here that our first parents uh, were vegetarians, using this uh, term right now. They were only given plants to eat, no meat. Because meat means they have to kill animals. Killing takes place. So only plants were given to them. And... Next verse, and to all those beasts of the earth and all the birds 
in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. Even the animals, they will only eat plants. Because if they are like lions now, they have to kill another animals. That wasn't the situation before the fall. Meat was given to men after the flood in Genesis chapter 9. But the first time God says, now you can eat, uh, you can eat uh, uh, animals. Uh, and ever since uh, has been our habit. Uh, and it was so, God saw that all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. This is the end of chapter uh, 1. And then if you are familiar uh, with the stories, chapter 2 is another account of the creations. And some people will think whether this is the continuations of the story of creations. But it's actually more like a, uh, a, a complementary story that uh, uh, tells the story of creation, especially about men and a little bit more details about others. Now the Lord God... Uh, uh, had planted a garden in the east in Eden. In the east could be from the writer perspective in the east of Jordan River. Uh, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, uh, two weeks from now, uh, Mike Brummel will be speaking more on this, so I don't want to spoil this. What is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, tree of life that is planted in the garden? And uh, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it was separated into four headwaters. Some will translate this as a more like, not a headwaters, but more like a delta uh, of water. But we see the names of the river here. The name of the first is Pison. It winds through the entire land of Avila, where there is gold. The gold of the land is good. Aromatic, resin, and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, until now, the scholars haven't really found out where the river of Gihon and Pison uh, are located. It's very difficult, but uh, we, we still have the river of Euphrates and uh, Tigris. We have many uh, brothers from Iran and Iraq here. Probably, they just think probably, maybe the Garden of Eden physically is somewhere there. Uh, from the Persian Gulf of the, the Christian there, that is the delta of uh, Mesopotamia. The word Mesopotamia means a land between two rivers, Euphrates and Tigris. That is, that is the, among the first civilizations that uh, we just don't know. Two rivers are there and... Uh, there is a garden, it disappears right now, but there God planted a garden and he put man there to work. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded them, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge, good and evil, and when you eat of it, you will surely die, which we are going to learn more in one or two weeks' time. My assignment today is to talk about work. What are the original design blueprint of God for work? As we see, we have understand, understood work in our culture, our educations, and some can be negative, others can be positive. But what does the Bible has to say about that? Number one for me, or for the text, work is 
a privilege. It's a gift. It's a privilege from God given to us. Why is uh, work a privilege? Because it is part of us being created in the image and likeness of God. Last week we had a sermon on created in the image and likeness of God. We are similar to God. We are like God, but we are not God. God is the creator. We are created with the creative power. God is a rational being. We are created with the ability to think and to reason. God is a person, a personal God. Christian God is a personal God, which is, can be different from other uh, religions. And we are created with a personality. Uh, our God is a working God. We are created with hands and feet to be able to work and so forth. And one of them is, uh, is to work. Our God is a working God, and that's why He creates us to work. The very first, uh, first of the Bible, or the first book of the Bible, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. God works from the beginning to create heaven and earth. And 26, 27, 28, He created us in His image, and we are now to represent Him in this world to take care of the creations for our life through work. So work is a privilege. It is a gift uh, from God. It is inseparable part of us being created in His image and His likeness. In other words, if you believe that you are created in His image and likeness, Work is part of that. Secondly, it is a privilege because work is given before men fell into sin. Many people will think, I have to work because Adam and Eve fell into sin. It is a consequence of sin. It is not. We just read chapter 1, chapter 2 of Genesis uh, we, uh, God asked Adam and Eve to work already before the, the fall. Adam was given tasks to name all the animals in chapter 2, verse 17, because he represents God over the creations before the fall. Uh, in our group, some uh, of men, some for the first time last year we had, last season we had in the men's group, a man and his work, some for the first time heard that actually work is not part of the sinful work actually initially. It is from the beginning given to us. So we could say that uh, work is holy, work is sacred, work is noble. Work is good. Work is a privilege. It's an honor for God, for us, to be given this uh, privilege. So why there are so many problems in the world right now with work? It is because of sin. Uh, you can see in Genesis chapter 3, we can uh, learn more later on, but uh, <clears throat> the difference is the intensity of work before the fall and after the fall is more the difference. We have to now work harder to earn a living. God says to Adam, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, this is a special case only because Adam was asked by his wife uh, to eat the fruit. It is not a general principle that we are uh, not to listen to our wife. Uh, that, that, should be a great pro that will be a great problem uh, if you don't uh, listen to them. Uh, it is a very specific case. You must not eat from it. Curse is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it. In all the days of your life, it will be, uh, produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. And since from it you were taken, for dust 
you are, and to dust you will return. And still here, I don't see that the work was cursed. The land was cursed. And that's why the work has to be harder to till the land. Work remains good. And yet, now we can see problems in the world because work is done by sinful people with other sinful people. Work is done in the broken world, in the, in the sinful world. That's why sinful people trying to exploit other people. Uh, that's why we see slavery. We see lots of other things happening uh, around the world, human trafficking, and you name it, you know. It is because work is done by sinful people in the sinful world. But it was not meant from the beginning. And I don't see, I don't read here, the work was cursed. The land was cursed, and that's why man has to work harder uh, 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 for that. So this number one, work is a privilege. Tomorrow morning when you wake up and you still work, Thank God, it's a privilege given by God for me to work. Number two, work is worship. When you study the Bible, read books, you sometimes uh, come across something that completely changes the way you think about many things. And for me, this is one of them. When I discover uh, that actually work is Worship. It is, it is in Genesis chapter 2, verse uh, 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work. Hebrew word is avod. And uh, take care of it uh, is another Hebrew word. that uh, Two words are used here. To work and to take care of it. It is interesting if we can ask the questions that when God uh, made the garden and put the man there, the first command was not to build an altar and to worship God in a sense, to sing and to pray. This thing, not to build a tabernacle or temple, but the first task that was given was to work the land, to work and to take care of it. So our gift first grandparents were gardener, farmer. Uh, now, why do I say this is a worship? Because we will discover later that the work to work and to take care of that are used later to describe the works of worship of the people of Israel and the priestly work in the temple. Uh, for example, I will read in Genesis, uh, in Exodus 3.12, when Moses, uh, God says to Moses, I will be with you, and this will be the sign that you, uh, uh, to you that is I who have sent you. When you brought the people of Israel out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. You will worship God. The same word is used. Here, the same word, avod, he used that. And for the rest, you read in uh, uh, Exodus, Numbers, anytime the word to serve God, to worship God, the, exactly the same word is used. And even more, uh, uh, the, these two works, to work and to cultivate or to take care, are exactly the same word used to describe the priestly work in the temple. You can read uh, in uh, Numbers chapter 3, verse 7 to 8, Numbers 18. Uh, to keep the temple, to serve, to minister is the word uh, being used. To minister God, to perform the service, to serve, and those kinds of things. This is amazing. Work is worship. When Adam and Eve they work on the land and take care of that. They were doing that to obey God and to worship Him, to uh, glorify Him. So, 
So work is spiritual. There is spiritual thing in the work. It is not secular in a sense. It is not separated from God, which is happening now in quite secularistic, godless uh, society. But it has been from the beginning a spiritual thing. You worship God through your work. Ideas that we learn have consequences. So when we know about this, we ask the questions, why, why there is separations between what is sacred and what is secular? Why there is a, what people call a biblical dichotomy, uh, biblical uh, uh, gnosticism, because gnosticism is to separate between something sacred and something secular. Uh, this is what happens probably for many of the people. You look at the, the, the left picture. God and spiritual, moral and secret, grace, faith, ethics, missions, discipleship, theology. God is only cares with that. And the other side is work, business, money, politics, God is not interested with that. There is a dichotomy with that. But where does it come from? Why? It is not from the beginning. Uh, historian has, uh, church historian has found out that actually this is coming from the probably uh, the early or end of 3rd century through the writing of the early church fathers. They begin to isolate the so-called spiritual things from the so-called everyday life. When they began to build monasteries and living in a monastic life, they withdraw themselves from the public to the desert and they built the uh, building themselves and isolate themselves with that. There are lots of good things happening there. But then people begin to see that there is a separation. Uh, this man says, in the medieval church, having a vocation or calling referred exclusively to the full-time church work. Maybe you hear the word vocations and occupations. Sometimes we call uh, our job my occupations, and occupations mean something that occupies you. Uh, but vocations means calling. Uh, it is a calling. It's a from Latin word means calling. So whether you see your work as a, an occupations or a vocations, as something that occupies you, you have to do because you have to, or this is a calling from the Lord. But throughout the church history, vocation is only, only related to church work. They tend to ignore the fact of the priesthood of all believers. We are all priests. All the things that we do as priests is to glorify God. Whether you are a teacher, whether you are a preacher, whether you are a businessman, whether you are a pastor, whether you do work through Monday to Saturday or what you do on Sunday, that is all actually part of our vocations. But that was not the case until Reformation starts. It was Martin Luther who began to uh, restore the idea of the priesthood of all believers. We are all, uh, all, all priests, and all we do is to glorify God. This is what uh, he says. The works of monks and priests and pastors and Sunday school teachers, we can add missionaries and others, however holy and arduous they may be, do not differ on wheat in the sight of God from the works of the rustic laborer in the field or the woman going about her household tasks. All works are measured before God by faith alone. Good news for the ladies who work in the house. The things that you do, also measured by faith, bear, carries the same weight. For someone who likes me standing here and preach, teach, all for the glory of 
God. That should change the way we see and feel our work and experience our work every day. Uh, someone will tend to ignore the things they do every day to seek for a better work in the church, which is, which has some people need Jesus, people need to be discipled, but once again, the work that we do every day, whatever do, or you do, is to glorify God. And that's why Paul says this later in the New Testament. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Paul was writing this to the slaves in Colossae and in Ephesians. Now, slaves at the time were much worse than right now, if that is. It was property of their masters. They were very hard. And yet Paul says to them, whatever you do, and serving, do it with all your hearts. Do it the best, other translation says. All the best you can, as if to the Lord. When you teach the schools, do it as bad as you can, as for the Lord. You're working in the company, and business, uh, whatever. Uh, housewives, do for the Lord, because it is a worship. There is no separations with that. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. says something like this. It's, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets like Michael Angelo painted, or Beethoven composed music or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He will sweep streets so well that the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here live a great street sweeper who did his job well. Work is worship. Work is spiritual. Number three, work is a steward of God's creation. Now, before we talk about uh, these three uh, things here, I will uh, bring you back to the, what we heard in the last three Sundays. Sunday, uh, number one, we heard that God created heaven and earth, natural uh, world with uh, nearly unlimited potentials. God never created oxygen after he did that. There is enough oxygen for everyone how many people will live in the world. God never created more plants or more physic in the physical world. There is enough potential here to reproduce. That's why chapter 129 says, I give you the seed-bearing plant. There is a, there is a power of reproductions uh, uh, there. That is number one we learned uh, first Sunday. Last Sunday we heard about God created man and woman in his image and likeness to represent him, to be like him, but not him. We are like God. We are not God. Uh, we are similar to God. We are not with this ability to create, to work, uh, to reason, to produce. And now we hear that then God asks us to use all this that they have created within us over the creations, to steward the, uh, the creations. Uh, we have, I've been working among the many, I uh, would say, not poor, but people who are probably struggling in their lives financially and others. And one of the things I, 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 we discovered is, is actually how you feel the world. Because many people, they have lots of resources among them. They're not able to discover that. There's, there's something like blinding their eyes and minds not, not to see that. There's, they're living in a, a kind of powerless, fatalistic mentality that that is, if I'm born poor, I'm meant to be like this. It is my destiny. I cannot change it. They forget that the nature is given with lots of resources, and I myself created is given lots of abilities uh, to 
steward that. And, and that's because there are three main uh, views. I will just go uh, quickly maybe you, uh, for us to be aware of that. Number one is animistic view of the world shared by many people. Animistic view means nature is to be worshipped. It is not to be touched. It's not to be steward. You, you just see this big tree. You come and you worship. There's mountains, there's rocks. It should be worshipped. Uh, while probably there is lots of resources that, that you can use. The other uh, view is secularistic, godless view. We'll see nature has a very limited resources. The pie is only like this. It's very limited. So we have to all work hard to take this pie. Otherwise, you don't get it. Take as much as you can. Exploit it. Because if you don't do, others will take it. Consumeristic, exploitative view of the world around us. And if you follow the secularistic view, you will think also that now, because the nature is limited, the numbers of people are growing, increasing more. So what we do, whether we try to increase the numbers of resources or we kill people. I saw one documentary some one guy who loves the nature so much, he said, I, I feel trouble to see many people. We should do something with this. This is a real one. We should do something with this. We have to get rid of people less and less so we can share and enjoy the nature more. And that is a secularistic, godless view. What is the biblical one? We have learned God has created the, this nature, this world, with nearly unlimited potential. It is meant to the work that will tap into these resources, steward this for the good, for our well-being, and uh, uh, for others. It is men who decide the value of things. It is men who discover uh, new things. Uh, in the past, people can probably only harvest rice once a year. Now you can do three or four times a year, even more than that. Man is able to make new type of seed to produce more. Uh, people were worried about the, this, there will not be enough space, but now we can create the uh, uh, apartments and, uh, uh, then, and you can have more people in very limited amount of space. Men through work will, will be creative, will be able to find solutions uh, in, uh, in the world. Think about fossil fuel. Many years ago, it was like a, like a mud trampled by people somewhere in the Middle East or probably also in Indonesia. They didn't know the value is until men invented machine that needs fuel. And suddenly, this mud turns into Black gold, basically. And there are many more resources out there. We just don't discover it. So, we are called through our work to steward God's creations, and the Bible says to be productive and flourish. Multiply, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it. It is to be productive in our works. To protect, Genesis 2.15, to take care of that, not to be exploitative, not only to take, but to give, to be contributive to men, uh, to protect the man who works, not to take advantage of the weak and uh, the poor in our society, and to bring provisions. We work to provide for, our, for us, for our family, that is it. God has given, He says, I give you all the seed bearing plants for you. But seeds alone cannot bear anything until the hands of men take it, plant into the land, the soil, and will grow and bear fruits. That's why the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, if someone doesn't work, 
he should not eat. You have to work. The potentials are there. We are called to work, and God provides us through work. We had last week, we pray, give us our daily bread, but the bread will not come directly from heaven because there is bakery. There is someone, a farmer, to farm wheat, and we will transfer to someone else in the bakery to bake bread, and will come to our hands. Everything that we enjoy in life comes to the labor or to the work of something. So, tomorrow when you go to work, you see, I want to be productive, to flourish. I want to bring some protections if needed. I would like to work to provide, not only for myself, for my family, uh, but also for others who are in need. Now, we live in a chaotic world right now. Lots of things are broken. It is not an ideal, an ideal as in the Genesis chapter 1. So part of our work is to bring a redemptive work. Redemptive work, to reverse all the curses, all the things that are broken in the world, and there are lots of lessons about that. I believe many here have gone uh, through that. How can we feel our work? To restore someone's life, to restore someone's dignity, to change the community, to bring bright future to uh, someone starting from our family. So work is a privilege. Work is a worship. It's a spiritual thing. There is no separation between secular and sacred. Work is to steward God's creations for us, for others. Number four, work is to build His kingdom. Before I read this uh, quote, uh, Genesis 1, 28, God says, Multiply, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish. These are all royal language. It's a priestly, a kingly language to rule over uh, because we are representing God into this world. And when people study this, uh, this passage, especially at the end, chapter uh, verse 21, God rested. God looked back his work and he's, he's very satisfied. He's like an architect who built something and then you see, I'm really, I'm really uh, satisfied with this or an artwork. And they will see what the, the earth is like it's like a divine sanctuary where God rested. It's a good place. And he doesn't want to just let it go to be taken over by the devil, regardless of the fall. He still wants his people to work for his kingdom. And in chapter 2, he planted a garden, Garden of Eden. Now, what is, what is Eden, actually? Eden means pleasure, happiness, joy, delight. Uh, that, that describes something about this, this uh, place. And the uh, Greek translations for Eden is, or garden is paradisos, from which we have the word paradise. So it was a paradise on earth. God dwells there. God dwells there and had harmonious relationship with man and woman. Adam had this idea of, I'm now living in the kingdom of God, in God's sanctuary here on earth, in this paradises, in paradise. I think the, we have uh, Farsi brothers here. They use the Farsi language, Firdaus. I think it is quite similar, Firdaus which is also Bahasa Indonesia takes it. It's the Garden of Firdaus. It's, it's, it's an amazing place. Uh, and when people work together with God, 
has this perfect relationship. And when they work on land, they're doing that to build, to take care of his kingdom. Work no, is not only just to earn enough for us to live. It's not only an occupation or a job. It is a calling. It is a vocation. It is a work done for his kingdom here on earth. Can you imagine that when you are standing in front of children in a class, you are doing this for the kingdom, or you are serving food in a restaurant, you are doing this for his kingdom. And when we come to the New Testament, we learn more as Christians. We are given more than just the ability as created in the image and likeness. Because created in the image and likeness of God is shared by everyone. Believer, non-believer, Christian, non-Christian, all created in His image and likeness. That's why all has ability. Uh, we just read in Genesis chapter 4, if you take time to read, what, what did the descendants of Cain, the cursed Cain, did? Amazing. They discovered civilizations. They were the first inventor of metallurgy, or they were the first one to build the cities, to uh, uh, locate the animals, they work with music instruments. They are descendants of the cursed king. But how can the cursed generation could invent and create these things? Because they were given this ability as created in the image and likeness of God. Every one of us will do it. But in the New Testament, as believers, we are given something more. We are given gifts of the Spirit. We are given talents. We are given, uh, pr through prayer, we can connect with God. We are given signs and wonders through prayer. All these extra abilities only given to believers. For what? Uh, to build His kingdom. To build His work here on earth. That's why Richard Pratt uh, says, Take the portion of my kingdom. It is God saying, I'm making your steward over your office, whatever it is. Your workbench, your kitchen stuff. Put your heart into mastering this part of my world. Get it in order. Unearth is treasure. Do all you can with it. We don't labor simply to survive. Instincts do that. Instead, God has given each of us a portion of his kingdom to explore and to develop to its fullness. It's amazing. Can we imagine that every single Christian will see his job, his vocations, as a way to expand the kingdom of God here? Even as a wife, housewife here, kitchen stuff. Uh, and count. So there are four things. Work is a privilege. Work is worship. Work is to steward his creations. Work here is to build his kingdom uh, here on earth. In Ephesians 2.10, God says, I have prepared good works for you in advance to do. We read uh, uh, Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 10. 1 to 9 or 1 to 7 talks about the sinful people. You are created anew in Christ, which is purely the gift of God, grace of God. We don't deserve it. We are created anew. We are sinful. But after we are created or recreated, we are now given the good works to do. God follows through the same pattern like in Genesis chapter 1. He created us in His image and likeness, and then He gives us work to do. Spiritually, now we call it spiritually, we are recreated anew as a new creation, and we are given good works to do for His kingdom. Before I end, I will, I will still need to talk something that probably you will ask 
uh, these questions. What about rest and retirement? Rest and retirement. Uh, I mean, some seniors here will think, look forward to their retirement days and retirement years. Many people will hug so they can retire early and, and, uh, and, and what, probably lay on the beach. Um, rest is biblical. We, we read from Genesis 1, at the end of the creation, God rests. And when God rests, man begins to work. And in a sense, uh, we, we read that there is no evening. You know, seventh day, there was only morning. But there is no the, the, the other part. So some will say God is still resting until now. He has given his mandate to us to continue to work on this earth. You will say, I've, I've done my part to create this and provide this. Now you work. But seventh day, he rests. That is the pattern in, uh, in the Old Testament, Ten Commandments. You rest one day a week, which is, which is biblical. And even the festivals of the Jewish people in the Old Testament, lots of festivals, religious festivals. And some festivals can last for one week. No work. You just rest for one week, eat and drink. So uh, it is good. It's good after the harvest that we spend time to enjoy the harvest, the result, the, the fruits of the work. So if you are the one who don't want to rest and keep continue to work seven days a week, uh, 20 or oh, not 24 hours, maybe you work until you uh, feel asleep, it is good always to take rest. But there is a limit of time. Maybe some of us, we just, uh, we just want to rest as much as possible. Uh, I, I read one uh, 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 interview where one, one lady says, I don't have dream job. Then he was asked, what is your dream job? I don't have one. I only have my dream holiday. Yeah. I have my dream holiday. I don't have my, uh, my job. But what about retirement? As far as I know, reading from the Bible, there is no biblical foundation for retirement. Uh, you can stop working from a company or so, contract work, but we are, uh, we are not to retire. So it's, how do we do that? Every one of us can always continue to work in a different roles in, in the church, in our society, in the family. Maybe after you finish your full-time employment, you can become mentor for younger people. You can write books or do something you have been passionate about, but you don't have time because of the workload all these years. Uh, I don't see any of that. Uh, Moses worked until he was promoted to heaven. Paul works until he was taken back to heaven. Uh, everyone works until they were. Uh, Revelation 14 speaks about when we have this physical death, we are resting from the labor here. But the question also will be, in the eternity, what will we do? Are we only sleeping there in a new heaven and new earth, have nothing to do because we will be there forever. Or there is something for us to do there. Revelations will end. We start from Genesis, we'll end in Revelations uh, 22. In many cases, Revelation 1 and, uh, uh, sorry, Genesis 1, 2 and Revelation 22 are very similar. There is river there. There is tree of life, if you read in, uh, chapter, two of, chapter 22 of Revelations. So the history of the Bible starts from the garden and will end in the garden city of Jerusalem. And what happens there when we are going to be with God forever? The Bible says no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him forever. 
We'll serve him there uh, in eternity, a new heaven, a new earth. We'll continue to work, but probably work that is not cursed, work that is initially planned by God, work in the perfect garden, the garden city. So if you look forward to that, that is a message. Our work now is to prepare us uh, for that. Now, I hope you that through this tomorrow morning, probably when you have to wake up on 4 a.m. in the morning to go to work, you will be, thank you, Lord, that I still have this work to do, this job to do. And I will enjoy the traffic in Jakarta going to work. I still have this uh, work. Uh, this is a worship. This is when you are contrasted with very difficult clients and customers, say, I'm serving the Lord to this. Give me wisdom uh, to deal with that. So understanding this will help us tremendously to change the way we feel our work and our daily life. Let's bow down our head. I will uh, call the uh, uh, worship team to come forward before we finish with the response songs. So take a few minutes to think about first how do we feel our work? It is only an occupation, a job, or it is a, it is a privilege, worship, spiritual thing, and also to build this kingdom. Do you enjoy your work? Or you might think this is a this is a burden for me. Do you use your work to bless others or not? Do you have a higher purpose than just just prof pro proficiency? Maybe it is a time to think about retirement for some of us. What will I do? We, if you retire at 60 and God gives you a long life until 90 or something, there's 30 years of time left. How can God use me to use this so-called retirement for the church, for his kingdom, for others? Father God, we are so grateful to be reminded from the scripture that it's a privilege for us to work. Your work is, work is given to us is holy, is sacred, it is noble. That we use work there to worship you, to steward the creations, to be productive, to provide for us, our family, and for others, and to build your kingdom. Pray that you will bless each and every one of us here. Pray for those who probably have no job so far, that you will help them to see the resources, the abilities they have, regardless of their employment. And at the end, all we do is solely for the glory of God. In the name of Jesus, amen.